I don't remember my dad confirming to me that it was named after him until much later. And even then, he was, you know, very reluctant to do it. This is the story of John Joseph Kirby Jr., an American attorney whose surname has no doubt already caught your attention as he shares it with, well, Nintendo's roundest protagonist. And although you might assume that is a coincidence, it's not. John sadly passed away last October, and at his funeral, a video was played in which Howard Lincoln, the former chairman at Nintendo of America, spoke of his great admiration for Mr. Kirby, who he considered a close friend. This was accompanied by a written message from Shigeru Miyamoto, which described how they'd met back in the early 80s, and how John had been one of the reasons why Nintendo would go on to call Kirby, Kirby. So how did that happen? How did these two worlds collide? I recently spoke with John Kirby's two sons, John and Tim, to find out. Let's put it this way, all my classmates knew that my dad represented and saved the day for Donkey Kong. In 1982, Nintendo was not quite the household name it is today, not yet at least. The company was right on the brink of releasing the Famicom in Japan and later the NES in North America and Europe, but to fully understand this story, you need to know that that hasn't happened yet. Nintendo, at least in terms of its video game potential, is just getting started. For years, this Japanese company had been trying to break into the North American market, and it had finally managed it just one year prior, thanks to an arcade game by first-time designer Shigeru Miyamoto, a game that was proving extremely popular, a game called Donkey Kong. So we're at this crucial moment in Nintendo's history in which it's just starting to establish itself as a contender in an international entertainment industry when it's hit with a sucker punch. On the 29th of June 1982, Nintendo was sued by Universal Studios for trademark infringement. The claim being that Donkey Kong was actually a rip-off of the studio's own property, King Kong. John Kirby, well, he was hired as the lawyer to represent them in this battle. At the time, you know, Nintendo really was this very small sort of unknown company. And they obviously had the resources, you know, to pay a well-regarded law firm, but it was definitely a David and Goliath story. So what exactly was he up against here? Well, if you boil it all down, there are really two key arguments being made by Universal. The first is that a punter like you or I could too easily confuse the name Donkey Kong with the name King Kong, and that Nintendo was unfairly profiting from this association. I mean, let me tell you, by the way, as someone who's needed to write a video script that includes a good helping of both names, they can be surprisingly easy to mix up. And actually, when asked about the origin of the name, Miyamoto has said in the past, I've always thought the gorillas were Kongs, that's why I wanted to name it something Kong. And why does he think that all gorillas are Kongs? Why do most of us make that connection? Well, the origin story is out there. According to correspondence between Marion C. Cooper, the original creator of King Kong, and Douglas Burden, a fellow filmmaker and adventurer friend of his, Cooper had, and I quote, especially liked the strength of words beginning with K, and so it was during a conversation between the two of them that he'd settled on the name Kong for his monstrous gorilla. And so yes, the original source for the name Kong is quite indisputable, although it's worth noting that it's not Marion C. Cooper who's trying to sue Nintendo here. In fact, he died several years before this lawsuit would happen. It's Universal Studios. Cooper himself had faced his own legal battles during his lifetime with movie studios over who owned the rights to King Kong. In another letter to his friend, he'd write, they'd make me sorry I ever invented the beast if I weren't so fond of him. His son, Richard Cooper, would eventually sell the rights to King Kong to Universal Studios in 1976. All right, so that's the first problem for Nintendo, that the name Kong might be an issue. The other argument that Universal were making is that the plot of Donkey Kong, in which a giant ape kidnaps a woman, was also infringing on the storyline of King Kong. But is that true? There are certainly some obvious similarities here, the two Kongs, the damsels in distress, the would-be heroes trying to save them. But Mario, or Jumpman as he was originally known, was a mustachioed carpenter hurdling his way through a construction site to save his girl, while in the original movie, we've got the rugged Jack Driscoll, first mate of the venture. And the giant ape's demise is much grander than the one portrayed in Nintendo's arcade games he's brought down by fighter pilots atop the Empire State Building. Mr. Kirby was very keen to show these differences to the judge in person, and so requested an arcade cabinet be brought into the court and the game played in front of him. I almost was called upon to play the stand-up Donkey Kong game in court, but uh, luckily they, they, they got one of their uh, pros. This proved effective, with the judge stating that, at best, Donkey Kong is a parody of King Kong, noting the differences between the two apes in particular. 
Whereas King Kong was, and I quote here, a ferocious gorilla in quest of a beautiful woman, Donkey Kong, by comparison, was, and this is another quote, farcical, childlike, and non-sexual. I'm very sure that there are certain corners of the internet that might disagree with that last point, but let's not linger too long on that thought. I'd shower you with coconut cream pies. You see, Mr. Kirby wasn't finished. Not only did he argue that the two storylines were in fact different, he also had his own curveball to throw. Universal Studios, he claimed, didn't even own the rights to the name King Kong or the character in the first place. And better yet, the movie studio itself had proven this in an American court of law just a few years beforehand. I can't remember which uh, official at Nintendo would say this, but they would say, first there is God, then there is Buddha, then there is Mr. Kirby. He directed the court to a legal dispute in 1975, a year before Universal purchased the rights from Cooper's son, in which the studio had argued that a novelization of the King Kong story had now entered into the public domain, which meant it could produce its own movie based on that novel and nothing else without paying a penny to either the Cooper estate or RKO Pictures, the studio that had produced the original film in 1933. This led to a good deal of back and forth over who exactly owned which parts of the King Kong trademark, and that remains somewhat muddled even to this day. But let me read you something from one of the judges once the Universal vs Nintendo case reached the Court of Appeals. It'll give you some idea of just how compelling Mr. Kirby's argument must have been. Universal's assertions in court were based not on any good faith belief in their truth, but on the mistaken belief that it could use the courts to turn a profit. Ouch. In the end, Nintendo emerged unscathed from this lawsuit, and Universal Studios were in fact required to pay almost $2 million in legal fees, photocopying expenses, costs incurred creating graphs and charts, and lost revenues. I imagine that's just standard legal language, but can I just say that some of those things sound more expensive than the others? And to thank Mr. Kirby for his work, and they were thankful, Nintendo gifted him a 27-foot sailboat named the Donkey Kong, along with the rights to use that name on any vessel of his choosing in the future, that being a nod to the dispute itself. We, we still have it. It's, um, it actually it played a, a big role in my wedding uh, with a big flag. I think it was our wedding hashtag, which was um, a play on Kirby's Dreamland. It was uh, Kirby's Dream Girl. Mr. Kirby would continue to represent Nintendo in the years to come, and according to his two sons, this meant that they were rarely discouraged from playing video games as they grew up, although it was usually preferable if those games were at least Nintendo. But what's it like as a kid, speaking to your friends, going to school, when your dad actually does know the people at Nintendo, when he saved them, in fact? Well, I asked him, who, by the way, mains Kirby in Super Smash Bros., I'd like to point out, uh, if he had any particular memories from his childhood. Growing up, we were very much a Nintendo household. Um, Shigeru Miyamoto actually came over and had dinner at our house um, a few different times. One time, it was, this is sort of embarrassing, but I was a, a big RPG fan. My favorite game at the time was Final Fantasy Tactics. And um, he you know, asked if he could watch me play for a while. And he sat there, you know, when I think I must have been in like sixth or seventh grade, and you know, watched me just play the PlayStation for an hour. As for the link between John Kirby and Nintendo's spherical boy, both sons mentioned that their father rarely liked to brag about the connection, despite their best efforts to make him do so. So here's a quote from Miyamoto when asked about it by Game Informer in 2011. Yes, it is a fact that I met John Kirby and got to know him when he was defending us during the lawsuit against Universal, and it is a fact that the Kirby name was partially chosen in connection to him, but it wasn't named after him. Instead, we had a list of names that we were looking at, and Kirby was one of the names on the list. As we were going through the list and narrowing down the selections, we saw that Kirby was there, and we thought, John Kirby's name is Kirby, and started thinking that if those two had a connection, that would be kind of funny. And I mean, it is kind of funny, he's not wrong about that. Uh, but before I wrap this video up, I want to just go on one small tangent, if you'll allow me, and that is to say that although this video has focused on John Kirby's work with Nintendo in the uh, early to mid-1980s, it actually does him something of a disservice to only talk about his career through the lens of that one particular case. In the 1960s, for example, as a 22-year-old summer intern at the Justice Department, Mr. Kirby uncovered some of the very first documented proof that African-American citizens were being stopped from registering to vote in Mississippi. He'd end up showing these findings in person to the Attorney General, one Mr. Robert Kennedy, and that evidence would go on to play a role in establishing the Voting Rights Act 
1965. In the summer of 1963, he was involved in school desegregation as one of the chaperones to the very first black student to enroll in a white Alabama public school, the six-year-old Sonny Herethard. And after the Kent State Massacre of 1970, he helped write the report commissioned by the President's office which described the shootings as unnecessary, unwarranted and inexcusable, which in turn infuriated the Nixon presidency. That is to say that his later years may have seen him working for private companies like Nintendo, but early on in his career, Mr. Kirby was a champion of civil rights. Worth a mention, I think. You know, working on this video has got me thinking about writing my own King Kong story but one for a more modern, accepting audience. Because yes, King Kong is a large gorilla, but let me pose this question to you. Why does that have to mean he can't also be our friend? And so yeah, I've been playing around with a few ideas, although it does turn out that story writing and world building is actually quite involved and requires like a lot of organization, which is why I'd like to tell you about our latest sponsor, Campfire Pro. Campfire Pro is a writing toolkit that lets you keep track of, well, everything basically. For example, with each of your characters, you may want to have a sheet in which you show their personality traits, their physical attributes, note the backstory so you can reference that as, as you work. Sorry, one, just one second. Right. Um... Yeah, no, I, um... Yeah, so I've no, that's actually a cease and desist. So I'm gonna quickly just change the name on that one um, to let's try King Kang. Right. So as I was saying, that's uh, yeah, no, that no, that is another one. Um, I tell you what, I'm just I'm just gonna use the the footage that Campfire Pro sent over to me themselves because I'm sure that'll have nothing to do with any kind of existing trademark. As well as managing all of your various characters and how they interact, Campfire lets you hammer together a timeline and then link those characters to the plot points they're actually involved in. The world building pack expands upon this, allowing you to organise things like items, languages, religions, whatever your world consists of. Maybe it has magic, well this is where you'd keep track of all its spells. And if that sounds like something you'd like to try, Campfire Pro is free to use until the end of April. Just use this link, which you can also find in our video description. And normally it's a one-time purchase of $49.99. Thank you so much for watching, and as ever, a huge thank you to our patrons for supporting this work directly. We'll see you in a couple of weeks.